you want to get your Bibles open, we're in Habakkuk again today. We are going to be finishing up chapter 1 of Habakkuk, and in a moment we'll stand for the reading of God's Word and for prayer. But let me begin with this. In Isaiah, we are told in the year that King Uzziah died that Isaiah saw the Lord. And you recall that the Lord was seated on, seated on his throne, and he was high and lifted up. And in that place of glory, there were seraphim. And the Bible tells us with two wings they covered their feet, with wings they covered their faces, and with two wings they flew about. And you'll also remember how they responded in that moment there in the presence of God and continue to respond. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then they continued, and they continued to say over and over again the same thing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. When Isaiah was blessed to see that, it says that he responded and said, Woe is me, for I am undone. If you want to get out your devices, you can find out what the word undone means. It means I'm ruined. It means I've come to the end. There's nothing left. I am undone. And he said, For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And then he tells us the reason why he sees, understands this. He says, for I have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah understood who he was because he got a glimpse of the glory of God. And this is true for you and me as well. We don't understand who we are. We don't base it upon what we think about ourselves or other people view us. Our understanding of ourselves comes from understanding who God is. And the fact that God is holy is critical for our existence. If you want to talk about an existential threat, imagine if God could change then we would be in a world of hurt. But God is God. He cannot change. He cannot deny himself. And for believers, this is a great comfort, that he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In the midst of the things that we go through, we can cry out to God and say, God, I don't know what's going on, and I don't understand your plan, but I know you. And I know you have a good plan, and I know you will do what is right, and I know you will take care of me, for I am your child. The God is holy is the premise of Habakkuk's second prayer, that we're going to look at today. If you recall the context of this particular book, sin is abounding in the nation. The wicked are prospering. The justice system is failing. And the prophet is burdened, not just by the decline of the nation, but also with the responsibility that he has to pronounce God's judgment. And what is God's judgment for the people? The wicked people in the nation are going to receive a wicked nation to come in and to punish them, the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk at this point is a bit concerned. God, yes, I cried out to you, I agree we're living in a wicked time, but is it really a righteous thing to bring in a people even more wicked to judge your own nation? I know you're holy, but is this plan holy? We're going to work through this prayer very specifically, and then at the end we're going to come back and add to our principles today because this is connected to us because every one of us asks the question why on occasion, and this book sure gives us guidance on how to deal with that question of the question why. I ask you to stand with me now for reading of the passage beginning in verse 12 to the end of the chapter. Listen now to Habakkuk's prayer, his second prayer to the Lord. He says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord, for you have appointed them for judgment. O rock, you have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make them like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook and catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because by them... Their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? I'd like to ask Gary Dial if you'd pray at this time, please. Let's pray. Father, we have gathered here this morning to praise you in song and to worship you for who you are. As we sang at the beginning, we are made to worship, Father. As we prepare to hear your word, Please soften and open our hearts. Give us better understanding of your truths and of who you are. As we go through life, we need to be reminded again and again 
of your greatness, mm -hmm. your mercy, and your promises. Mm -hmm. Give your servant boldness to proclaim your truth this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. We see he begins his prayer with the affirmation that God is holy in verse 12. To be holy means he's set apart, he is righteous, he does not change, and he says he is from everlasting. This particular phrase, these two words are probably borrowed from Moses' prayer in Psalm 90. You recall Moses there talking about how God had delivered his people. It says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We cling to God as believers because of who he is, because of his character. He is a God who, again, does not change, and we are confident of this. The writer of Hebrews talks about the fact that God makes promises, and because he can swear by no one higher, he swears by himself. By the way, if you want to read something later today in your day of rest, read Hebrews chapter 6. It's a wonderful passage which reminds us that God will take care of us if we are his children. Nothing can separate us from his love. And part of the reason is because God is God. And he's made a promise, and he can swear by no higher, so he makes an oath. And then the writer says, by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. And that, again, is our anchor, that God is God and does not change. Now, those two immutable things, there's lots of people who have speculated upon what it is. I'm not sure I have the right answer. But Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9 speaks about when God makes promises, there are two things that you can rest assured of. Number one, God is God. And number two, God is faithful. If you want to say it the way a little child would say it in prayer, God is great, God is good. God is great, he is God, God is good, he is faithful. And I think this captures the idea of what Habakkuk is saying here at this particular point. You see his confidence. He says, Lord, you are the Holy One, right? And then he says, with confidence, we shall not die. How can he have such confidence? Because the Lord is his rock. And he says that in verse 12. He is strong, he is stable. And he recognizes that even in this judgment, God has a purpose. If you look at verse 12, what's the purpose of God's judgment here? It's not for destruction, it's for correction. Even in the midst of when God brings judgment upon a nation for his people, it is still a discipline that for correction to draw them closer to the Lord. But the last thing I want you to notice in this verse before we move on is the personal nature of his relationship with God that is connected to the character of God. Look at that again in verse 12 for just a moment. Are you not from everlasting? And here it is. O Lord, my God, my Holy One. It's not just some God up in the sky who's unknown, but it is the one true God who is holy, and he anchors himself to the God who is holy, my Holy One. Now this affirmation that God is holy leads him to two questions. And sometimes the language in Scripture is not the way we would say things. So let me tell you up front what the questions are, and then I'll read them again. Why do you endure the wicked? If you are holy, why do you put up with the wicked? And the second question is this. <clears throat> why do you make men so weak? If you are holy, why do you make men so puny, so weak, and so dependent? Listen to the first question in verse 13. Why do you endure the wicked? <clears throat> You are of pure eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person, listen to this, more righteous than he? That'll come into play in a little bit. So two comments here. Does God not look upon that which is wicked? Can God not look upon that which is wicked? God is everywhere. And therefore, I don't think the writer here is saying is God doesn't see it. I think what the writer is saying, what Habakkuk is saying, is God does not look upon it with favor. If there is wickedness, that will bring condemnation and wrath. But the other thing is, honestly, we cannot fully understand why God puts up with wicked people, can we? Why in the garden when man and the woman sinned, why didn't he just say, that is it, we are done with mankind, we're moving on to something else? Why does God endure? And I don't have all the answers, but from Scripture I can say these things. Number one, it's not yet time for this world to come to an end. Revelation chapter 15 indicates that his wrath is not yet full, and until it is full, our days will endure. But with that, there's also some comfort. Sadly, it also means that wicked people are an instrument in God's hand. 
They will bring punishment upon wicked people, and they will also bring discipline upon believers. But in addition to that, keep in mind that the fact that there is wicked and evil, it provides for us a contrast, the wicked and evil, to the grace of God. And Paul, in writing to the believers at Rome, said as much. God wants to put on display his power and even his wrath, and therefore he endures with vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and he does this so that his mercy and his grace might be all the more pronounced for those who are redeemed. So for you and I, that's a blessing. Every now and then we ought to stop and realize what we deserve and what we receive, God's grace. But with that, there's one other thing. His enduring with the wicked is a blessing because he's not yet done saving people. And again, this will come into play in a little bit. Aren't you thankful that God is still the God who saves and the time has not yet come? When you think about those that you love and those that you care about who are not walking with the Lord, the time is not yet ended, so we continue to make our appeal to Him. The second question is, why do you make men so weak? Listen to verse 14 again. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? I don't know if I have... Does anybody here an expert on fish in this particular place? I, fish, they just kind of wander about. There doesn't seem to be a real purpose, and there's no leader to the fish community. Can you believe that? And then these creeping things, I guess like cockroaches, right? They just wander about. They have no real leader to organize them like the ants. Contrast is clear. God is God, and we are not. God is great, and God is strong, and we are puny, and we are needy. And this is important for us because we, it is always wrong for us to think too lofty of ourselves to get too high and mighty and think we're the ones who did it and pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. It's amazing, even listening to Christian stations, Christian radio stations, how oftentimes they miss the mark and talk about something other than God. How often do I hear the phrase now, in times of trouble, I trust in my faith. No, 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 we trust in God, not in our faith. A child of God knows and affirms that we are weak and we are dependent, and this is good for us to know that he is God and we are not. The last couple of days of this week, uh, my oldest son and his family went away, and they asked us to watch their dog. Now, in times past, their dog was a small dog, maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 pounds on a bad day if it ate too much, right? And it was an old dog, and it didn't have much to do. But they have a new dog. Their new dog was born on Easter. So it's still a puppy, Okay. And, um, but it is a big dog. They named it Sunday. Um, I think the breeds are a Great Pyrenees and a Bernice Mountain Dog. And the third one, I can't remember, I think it's Elephant is the third one. <laughs> the dog is huge. When, if it, it's still a puppy, but it's over 70 pounds as a puppy. If it comes up to you and jumps up, the paws go on your shoulders and he's face to face with you. I don't care if you're over six foot tall. This is a big dog, okay? But... But she does not get on the table. But she doesn't have to. <laughs> she can walk up to and lay her head on the table. This is how big she is, right? Now, I'm not a dog expert, but we had it for, her for two days, and I do know these things about a dog. A dog needs, number one, exercise, number two, discipline, and number three, affection, and in that order. Exercise, discipline, and affection. So I went on long walks with the dog. She's a good walker, but every now and then I have to remind her who is in charge. She also, of course, needed discipline. She's still a pup, and she likes to chew on things. So we set up some boundaries, some perimeters in the house. We corrected her. She needed to know who was in charge. But she also needed affection. And this big dog, it's not just enough to pat her on the head and say, nice girl. You've got to go outside and play with her. And as a pup, she doesn't know all the rules yet. She, I mean, she could take you down in a heartbeat, right? So there's, she needs to know who's in charge even during times of affection, right? All of that is for her good, to know her place, to know she's not in charge and who is in charge. All of this is for our good, to know we're not in charge, God is. He's the master, he's the creator, he is the Lord, and it is for our good that it's organized this way. Now, to further contrast God's holiness, Habakkuk also says there's a contrast here. You're holy but the people you're bringing in are really wicked, these Chaldeans. Listen to how he describes them in verses 15 and 16. They take up all of them with a hook. So they're going to come in like fishermen. 
throw out their line and just take them by the hook. Or they catch them with their net. They're treating people like fish, right? And they gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. And then therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because by them their share is sumptuous and their food is plentiful. Now last week we started to look at these people. They were selfish, selfish individuals, selfish idolatry, faulty view of self, self-assurance, self-serving, self-exalting, self, self, self. That was the Chaldeans. This week we continue to see they're cruel, they're opposed to God. They wanted to have it all. When they conquered a people, they took so much more than what they needed. They plundered people and they left them ruined. But what's really frightening is not only do they not worship the one true God, last week we noted they worship the, the idols that they made, the gods that they made. This week we're told they would actually set up a shrine with their net and with their fishing pole and worship that. They are so removed from the one true God. And so Habakkuk can only conclude with this question in verse 17. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? To put it the way we would say it, God, you're holy. How long are you going to allow them to continue to do this? How much longer is this going to happen? Now, with that being said, I want to turn our attention now to concluding thoughts, which are really ones of application. Last week, we saw the question that Habakkuk asked was this, why are bad things happening? This, this week, we're seeing, why are you using bad people to judge us? Why is this taking place? So let's make it real personal. Let's say that you have gone or you're going through some difficulty. And sadly, this first one I know many of you can attest to. You've had a child who has suffered. They're in pain. They're hurting. Or they're wayward. They're, they're not seeking the Lord. And you're praying to God. And you're saying, God, why? Why does my child have to suffer? Why does my child, who has heard the truth, reject you? Especially when I look at others. When I look at others who I don't think did as good of a job raising their children as I've done. Why, why is my child suffering and struggle when you're God and you can take care of this? Why is this happening to me? Or perhaps you're struggling financially. You've worked hard. Last night I was thinking about this down at Bradford Place, looking at these folks there that are in that season of life where their days are numbered. You know, in the midst of what happened, they came in with a gurney that night, went down the hallway, just a reminder of how frail life is. And I thought to myself, how many of these folks here have worked hard all of their life and now financially they're at a place where they just don't have anything extra to maintain what little life they have now. Maybe you're, you feel that way. Maybe you're struggling financially. And then you look around and you see the government that's just printing money left and right like there's no tomorrow. And that certainly isn't helping us, right? Or perhaps you're the individual who's experienced loneliness. Oh, you're in the midst of people all the time. But nobody gets it. Nobody knows you. No one pays attention to who you are. No one recognizes you. No one seems to even try. And then you look around again and you see everybody else has got somebody to spend time with. Why am I all alone? Or maybe you're more like Habakkuk. Maybe like every morning you turn on the nose and it's just one more bad report of what's happening in our nation. You think, my goodness, can it get any worse? How bad will it get? Our nation's in decline, and yet those who are wicked, they flourish. They do just fine. You go to the Lord in prayer. And you pray and you pray and you pray, God, I know who you are. I know you're God and I know you are holy. So why? Why are you letting evil rule the day? Why are you allowing those who are wicked to prosper? How long, oh God, how much longer are you going to allow this to continue? Is that a good prayer? Is, is that a reasonable prayer? Is it okay for us to pray that way? I think in many cases it probably depends upon the purpose of our prayer. Why do we pray such prayers? Is it because we don't like life and we want to be happy and comfortable? Or is it truly conformed to how we're supposed to pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? But also you have to be really careful because if you find yourself comparing yourself to others, this is where we get into trouble. 
when in our midst of our prayers we're saying, God, I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm working hard, and I'm struggling. And then I look around at others, and oh my goodness, I'm not even sure they worry about you, but they might even hate you, God. And yet they seem to be just fine. Why is this happening to me? That brings us today to another principle when we ask the question, why of God? We looked at seven of them last week of the first 14, or seven of the first of 14 of them. Let me just take you back through those seven. Number one, desperate times call not for desperate measures, but desperate times call for dependent prayer, God-dependent prayer. We need to go to the Lord in desperate times. Our confidence must, not, must go beyond what God does or does not do. And unfortunately, oftentimes that's how we evaluate it. What have you done for me lately? It has to be based upon who God is. And therefore, we have to look beyond the events, the things that we experience, to the one who is the creator of history and is bringing it all to a purpose and to an end. Number four, do not expect any rule or any law to fix anything. Rules and laws don't change hearts. God must save. God must change hearts, the one who is the ultimate lawgiver. When asking the question why, we really want to have an answer, don't we? We want to connect the dots and know why this is taking place. But what we need more desperately than that is a great God, and our God is great. And therefore, look for, but don't expect to understand the ways of God. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Then number seven, this is the really hard one in the principles. God does use evil agents and evil to accomplish his will. It's a hard thing for us to accept, but God does do that, which brings us to number eight. Do not compare yourself with others in order to justify yourself with God. We all have a tendency probably to look to ourselves, I'm doing better today than I did yesterday, or to look to others and say, oh, they're much worse than I am. But the standard is with God, His holiness, and none of us have arrived there. So do not evaluate yourself with someone else in order to justify yourself before holy God, which brings us to the final principle for today. This goes back to Habakkuk, and now we're going to get into chapter 2. This is one of those occasions where I think the chapter division is, is probably the wrong place. There never was any chapter divisions when they were written, and I think chapter 2, verse 1, really needs to continue with what we're talking about today. After Habakkuk prays, after he questions God, is this holy, is this righteous, what you're doing? Look at how he resolves it in verse 1 of chapter 2. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch and to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. That's the last principle right there. Remain humble and teachable before God. Come boldly, come openly, come honestly, fearfully to the Lord in prayer. But it is not our place to demand an answer. But rather, like Habakkuk, we should wait upon the Lord and be prepared to be instructed by Him and then know how to answer when we're corrected. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should fail to come to God in prayer. As a matter of fact, I would say go boldly. Ask the questions that are upon your heart. There's a long line of believers who have done this. So we come with our questions, but here's the thing. We might leave without answers, but as we come to the Lord in humility, we'll leave with a changed heart. We'll be humble with him before, again. I want you to go to Job 23. Job 23. This might seem like an odd place to enter into the book of Job, because most of us probably read the first couple of chapters and then we skip to the end, right? But there's a lot in the middle. And what we see in Job is a man who really struggled with these things. And sometimes his words, the truth, the honesty, the authenticity of these words, I think really help us in our struggle as well. Look at Job 23. We're going to start in verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Even today my complaint is bitter. Anybody been there? Even today, I'm upset, God. My hand is listless because of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Do you see what he's saying here? Where's God? I want to go there. I want to present my case before him. 
I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? No, but he would take note of me. There the upright would reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Do you see what he's saying there? I have a case, Lord, to present. I should be heard. I think I'm okay. But God is so sweet to his children. Even when we come boldly and struggling, he begins to soften and change us and remind us once again of how much we need him. So notice how the prayer starts to shift now here in verse 8. Look, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. Now listen to this. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Do you see the, the language changing there? Oh God, you got to listen to me. I've got a case to present. I don't know where he is. But I do know this. He's going to work in my life. He's going to refine me. And I'll come forth as gold. Now look even more softer as you go down to verse 13. Notice again the acknowledgement, not of Job and his righteousness, but God and his holiness. But he is unique. And who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that he does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore, I am terrified at his presence. When I consider this, I am afraid of him. There's that reverence. For God made my heart weak, and the Almighty terrifies me. Because I was not cut off from the presence of darkness, he did not hide deep darkness from my face. A wise man will go to the Lord, but he will not seek to answer his own questions. He won't seek other people to answer. He'll seek the Lord, but if not given specific answers from the Lord, he'll rest in the fact that God is God, and God is good. Just a few final thoughts. Um, so here we are before, between Thanksgiving and Christmas time, and we're looking at a minor prophet by the name of Habakkuk, and we're talking about suffering. That really fits well with the preaching calendar, right? And yet I am amazed at how many comments I've gotten since last week as we started this little three-chapter book. How many people have said to me, I needed to hear that? This is what I need to hear right now because I am struggling with this, with this, with this, with this, or with this. But I've also been encouraged that this is a benefit in that almost everyone who has said that, they've realized that they, they don't need answers, that the focus is actually upon God and who he is. And we need that more desperately to know him than to get answers to our questions, to be reminded once again that God is indeed God. You see, that is the topic of our study, God, in all things. We don't need just enough to get from this week to the next. We need a theology, theo, theology of who God is that will sustain us every day and every moment of every day until we reach eternity with him. We need to see God. We need to know more of who he is. And so with that, I want to close out again today, and we'll do this the next couple of weeks as well. The last two verses of this particular book, where Habakkuk, after it's all said and done, says, Yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Again, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Would you stand and say that with me? We'll close out with prayer together. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. Dear Heavenly Father, may that affirmation be more than just what we said today with our lips. May it be the resolve of our hearts, the confidence that we have in our thoughts, that you are God, you are great, and you are good. You cannot change, and you hold us secure from now and for all eternity. Thank you that all this is only possible because your son intercedes for us. And I pray, Lord, if there is someone here today 
who finds themselves struggling but does not know you, who has not acknowledged that they are a sinner and confessed their sins and trusted in your Son, Jesus Christ, may today be the day of salvation. But Lord, for those who have, may their heart's desire be, their deepest affection be to know you, to see everything else as rubbish, as worthless, as not satisfying, and have their desire to draw near to you so that we might know that indeed you are the God of our salvation and you are our strength. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.